can gather together and sing these songs of praise and lift up your high and holy name, encouraging one another and admonishing one another, teaching one another through these same psalms and hymns. And Father, here momentarily we will gather around your table and remember the sacrifice made by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And Father, we thank you every single day for the love that you had for us, that when we were all destined to die and perish in our sins, Christ loved us enough that you sent him to this earth. He lived a perfect and sinless life, and he died there on the cross for us. And on the third day, you raised him up, and he's sitting this very day at your right hand, reigning eternally. Father, we're mindful this morning of those that we know that are suffering from physical and illness and injuries. Our brother Philip Warren, Sister Betty, and Donna Pinkston, so many others, you Crabtree, that we may not call by name, Father, but we know that you know their needs. But we come before you asking you in faith that if it be your will that you will restore them their much wanted health and they could be back with us worshiping you in spirit and in truth. 
Father, we thank you for this congregation that meets here from time to time. For those in the past that have set an example and for those today, Father, that are all here in attendance, we thank you for them. We thank you for the effort they've made to be here. But Father, we're mindful of those that could have been here but have chosen not to. They've gone back into the world. They've returned as the dog to his vomit. And Father, we pray that as we as faithful members of your body, we can reach out to them and let them know that they are loved, that they are missed, and how important it is for them to be in the fellowship of the body of Christ and to be here on the first day of the week, just as those in the first century did, worshiping you in spirit and in truth. Father, we thank you for the nation we live in, the freedom that allows us to gather here this morning without fear of persecution and outside interference. For those men and women that have put their lives on the line every single day to defend that freedom and those in times past that have given the ultimate sacrifice that we could gather here without fear, we thank you for them. But most importantly, Father, we thank you for the ultimate sacrifice made by Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. That when he could have set himself up as a king here on earth, he gave, he gave that up and he suffered that painful and humiliating death on the cross of Calvary to purchase our pardon and free us from the bondage of sin. We thank you, Father, for your word that we can open, we can read, we can understand, and we can apply to our lives, that we can know that our salvation is found in Jesus Christ alone. We can learn about the plan of salvation that you have laid out for us that is so simple, Father. And Father, we pray that we would also take the opportunity, every chance we get, to share the gospel with others that we come into contact with. And that they could hear that word, the seed could be planted, it could take root and another precious soul could be added to your kingdom, just as it was on the day of Pentecost. Father, we pray as we enter into this time of worship this morning, that everything that is said and done here will be in accordance to your word and well-pleasing in your sight. We ask for your forgiveness, Father, for any sins that are laid to our charge. <clears throat> we realize that we are not perfect. We never will be. But we are thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed there on the cross of Calvary that can redeem us from our sins and continually cleanse us and allow us to stand holy and righteous before you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning, I want us to take a look at the idea, looking at the Apostle Peter, looking at the fall and the return of the Apostle Peter. And give me just a moment. Let me get some things swapped around here. Click that. All right. We want to look at, as I said, the Apostle Peter. And the steps that he took as he fell as a faithful disciple of Christ, but also the upward steps that he took as his return back to being a faithful follower of Christ. Look at this morning with me. <clears throat> we're going to start out in Matthew chapter 14. Matthew 14, we're going to begin with the fall of Peter. There beginning at verse 22, Jesus and his disciples are in a boat. And it says, straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go before him unto the other side where he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out in fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him in verse 28, saying, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he looked, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But in verse 30, when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? As Peter was walking on the water, his faith weakened. And he doubted and he began to sink. It is necessary that our faith remain strong. Let's look at that idea in Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews 3, there about verse 12. See what the writer has to say about that. 
Tá bom. You gotta be kidding me. <sighs> I'll do this again this week, all right? Just once, I'd like for this thing to work the way it's supposed to. Works fine before we get started, and then here we go. Hebrews 3, verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you of an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Don't let your faith become weak. Peter's faith, as long as he was looking at Jesus, was strong. He said, if it be you, let me come out on the water to you. But what happened? He got distracted by everything going on around him. He saw the waves crashing up. He saw the, he felt the wind blowing on him, and he looked away from Jesus, and his faith fell. This was the beginning of the fall of Peter. Because what was it that Jesus told him in verse 31 there of Matthew 14? He said, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And why do we doubt? And let this be a lesson to all of us. Even the apostle Peter, when he had the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ right in front of him, he still fell into doubt and he slipped away. You and I today, we cannot physically see Jesus right in front of us, but we're still going to have distractions and we're going to fall away. But guess what? We make one of two choices. We can continue to fall, or we can focus back on Jesus. Well, look with me at Mark chapter 14. And pray that technology works like it's supposed to when I key this in. Mark 14. There we go. Verse 27. Mark 14, verse 27. Jesus said unto them, his disciples, all of you shall be offended because of this night, of, because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said unto him in verse 29, although all shall be offended, yet will not I. And in verse 30, Jesus said unto him, verily I say unto thee that this day, even in this night, before the cock crowed twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. But he spake the more vehemently, if I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they all. Peter was just beside himself. Jesus, I'll go wherever you go. No matter what happens, I'm not going to deny you. Jesus told him, he said, before this night is over, you're going to deny me not once, not twice, but three times before the sun comes up when the cock crows. Peter said, oh, no, 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 no. He said, I'll die with you, Jesus. And everybody else said, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. Have you ever had that happen to you? People tell you, oh, yeah, whatever you, whatever you need me to do, I'm there. You know, that's a common phrase we hear around these parts. Of, oh, if you need anything, just holler at me. And then when they holler, do you go running? Or he's like, oh, well, I'm kind of busy right now. I can't get there. That's what Peter was doing. He didn't realize until the heat got turned up what he was getting himself into. What else? Look there on that same idea. Even though Peter was so confident that he would stand with Jesus no matter what, look what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, down about verse 12. Paul tells the church at Corinth, he says, Wherefore, let him that think he standeth take heed lest you fall. Oh, it's easy to talk a good game about how you'll stand up for Jesus. Oh, it's easy to talk about it. But when the pressure's on, when the heat is on, and it's time for the rubber to hit the road, are you really... Sold out for Jesus like you claim to be? I don't know how many of you, and I, and I contemplated having a lesson on this this week, and I may still yet. I don't know how many of you saw the story about our county mayor this week. We won't get into the whole debate about wearing a mask or not wearing a, wearing a mask. That's not what I'm here to talk about. But his answer to whether or not he was going to 
mandate wearing a mask in Lincoln County? His answer was, he was of the Baptist faith and he would wait for the Holy Spirit to tell him what to do. Well, Mr. Bayer, out of respect, you're going to be waiting a long time. The Holy Spirit is not going to tell you what to do about a mask. And we may cover that topic in the coming weeks about what the Holy Spirit does and what the Holy Spirit doesn't do. But put yourself in that position. If someone were to come to you tomorrow and say, last night the Holy Spirit told me blah, 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 blah. Are you going to say, well, that's great. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad he's talking to you. Or are you going to use that as an opportunity that the door opens and say, well, maybe you need to rethink that. Because the Holy Spirit is not directly talking to me, you, or anyone else today. Okay? That's what I'm talking about when the heat is on. We're coming into the time of year where we're going to be gathered together with friends and family <clears throat> that may not understand what the Bible teaches. Maybe at one point they did know the truth, but through marriage and acquaintances and work, they strayed away. Are we going to keep, quote unquote, and I'm using my air quotes here, are we going to keep the peace in the out of respect for the holidays, or are we going to use that as an opportunity to teach someone and show them where their error is as far as what the Bible teaches? Because if you're going to just, quote, unquote, keep the peace and go along to get along, you're like Peter who said, I'll go wherever you go, Lord, until things get a little rough, and then eh, I'm going to back away from that one. We're on fire until the fire gets lit under us. What else did Peter do? Well, Mark 14, we're back over there for a second. <clears throat> Mark 14, right after Peter in verse 31, we left off. And remember what Peter said? He said, he spake the more vehemently. If I should die with you, Lord, I will, no, not, no, deny, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise, everybody else said the same thing. Oh, yeah, Jesus, we were right there behind you. But in verse 32, they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John and began to be sore amazed and be very heavy. And he saith unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. Jesus knows what's coming. And he's praying to the Lord, praying, praying to the Father. If it be your will, take this cup away from me. And he went forward a little and fell on his face and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I want, but what you will. In verse 37, the same ones who said, yeah, Jesus, I'm right there with you. Whatever you need me to do, Jesus comes and he finds them sleeping and saying unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Could you not watch one hour with me? Watch ye and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The truth, the spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And that's where we all are. We're not. All the spirit's on fire, especially Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Spirit's on fire. But the flesh is weak. When temptation and confrontation arises, eh, not so much. And again, he went away and prayed and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither will they what they would answer him. And he cometh the third time and saith unto them, Sleep on now, take your rest. It is enough, the hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed in the hand of sinners. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. The physical sleep occurred in Gethsemane. But today many are spiritually asleep. And God keeps on calling them to wake up. Look at Ephesians 5. Ephesians chapter 5, <clears throat> this idea of waking up spiritually, Paul tells the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 5 verse 14, he said, Wherefore he saith, Awakest thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. Wake up. Wake up. Is it so hard for you to keep your eyes open? And I'm not talking about physically. Because I'll be the first to tell you, when I hit that, that comfortable chair in my living room, I'm usually out. It's not what we're talking about. Jesus is talking about wake up spiritually and see what's going on around you. See the opportunities that abound to preach the gospel and to plant the seed. 
1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 5 at verse 16. Rejoice. Wake up and rejoice. What was Peter and the disciples doing in the Garden of Gethsemane? Even when Jesus was pleading with the Father to let the crucifixion pass from him, they couldn't stay awake with him for one hour. Well, back over in Mark 14, what else did Peter do? Mark 14, Jesus has caught him sleeping. He said, look, the, the, the crowd is coming. Here comes Judas to betray me. And what was Peter's answer to that? Well, in verse 43, immediately while Jesus yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief, chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same as he, take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come, he goeth straightway to him and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and took Jesus. And one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are you come out against a thief with swords and staves to take me? I was daily in the temple teaching you, and you took me not, but the scriptures were fulfilled. Peter's answer, when the multitude came to take Jesus away, that doesn't tell us here in Mark. We can go back into Matthew and Luke and John to get the account where it tells us that it was, in fact, Peter. And tells us exactly who it was, Malchias, the servant whose ear he cut off. Peter's answer was, let me just pull my sword out and cut somebody's ear off trying to save Jesus. No. The problem was, is that <coughs> facing the mob, he was trying to defend Christ. And it was a rash action that he took. Christ cannot be defended with any sword or any other physical weapon. But rather... How are we to defend Christ? Well, Hebrews 4 tells us that. Hebrews 4, in verse 12, the Hebrew writer tells us, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints of the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We don't need a physical sword to go out and conquer the world with Jesus Christ. You know what we need? There's the best weapon we have right there. But unfortunately, we get into the, well, I think, or I feel, or, or Grandma told me, or my favorite preacher said, and we have no ability to go out and defend the cause of Christ when the only thing we need is this right here. But many of us are too lazy. Oh, I don't have time to read that thing. Let me tell you something. Many of you will cuss this thing to the dying breath. But you know what I have on it? That right there. And if you got time to scroll through Facebook and look at funny memes and cat pictures, guess what you could be doing? That's right. You got time to scroll through the Bible. And find a passage. And the amazing thing about this is, when a question comes up, it has this little search feature. Search feature. So you don't have to know the verse, book, chapter, and verse. But if you know a few words of a verse that would apply to a situation, you just type it in there and it'll pull it up for you. It's amazing how it works. You know, you say, oh, of course, we, we, we didn't ever need that with our Bible. <laughs> you didn't? Guess what's in the back of this Bible? The search feature, the concordance, that was your search feature back in the day. But instead of lugging that big thing around, guess what? You got the Bible right in your pocket right there. You know what else you have with that too, by the way? You have the ability to tell someone, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but I know somebody that does. Let's send him a text. Let's call him right now. Amazing. Isn't it great to live in 2020 with the technology we have? Even sometimes it doesn't work for me like I want it to. We have no excuse today to not be defending the gospel of Christ. No excuse. We have more tools than we've ever had at our disposal. Got a whole stack of material out there that's gathering dust and falling apart from sun damage. It's doing a lot of good out there. 
but we won't use it. What else did, did uh, Peter do in his fall? Well, Luke chapter 22 tells us. Look at Luke chapter 22 with me. <clears throat> Peter in his fall away from being faithful to Jesus. Luke 22 verse 54, this is still on the same idea of how the multitude has taken Jesus away. In Luke 22 verse 54, Luke tells us that then they took him, Jesus, and led him and brought him into the high priest's house and Peter followed afar off. Does that describe some of us today? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to get too close because that, that guy, he talks a lot of scripture and man, I don't, I don't want to get too close to him because people may think strange things about me. I may, I, may, I may lose some of my influence and some of my friends and my family and my co-workers. It may, it may cost me socially. It may cause me physical and fiscal problems to get too close to this whole Jesus idea. This morning, I guarantee you, within a 10 or 15 minute drive, there are people sitting in an assembly for no other reason than because it helps them socially it helps them financially, and that's the only reason they are there. They are there to be seen. They are the modern-day Pharisee, as Jesus described. They have no desire to follow God's will. They have no love for Jesus Christ whatsoever, and no way in the world they're standing up for the principles of Jesus Christ and Christianity. They're in an assembly to be seen and be heard and patted on the back and, oh, good to see you, brother so-and-so. They're like Peter. They want, they want to follow, but mm, don't want anybody to see me. Following from afar off is what Peter was doing. No man can follow Christ afar off for long without losing sight of it. And we should always strive to be as close as possible. Look at Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Whoa. Get my fingers to cooperate with me this morning. Matthew 16, verse 24. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You want to follow Jesus? You don't get to do it on your terms. You get to do it on his terms. Because what did Jesus say? If you want to come after me, if you want to follow me, deny yourself. You're not living for yourself anymore. You're living for Jesus Christ. You are a servant to him. Why? Because he died for you. Do you need any other reason? Really? You owe everything to Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you deny yourself. Take up your cross Whatever persecution comes your way, because there's going to be persecution coming your way, and if you're not being persecuted for being a member of the body of Christ, maybe you need to step back and take and evaluate, man, what are people really seeing out of me? And follow me. If people are not mocking you, if people are not, <laughs> look at you, you sit there, that turn. trust me, I hear that. And yes, I hear that in precious little Petersburg, Tennessee. God's country, some of you won't call it. Yes, there are people right here, you and I know, that they will mock you for calling yourself a Christian. I promise you they will. There's some people, members of the Lord's body, that will do that. Believe it or not. 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11 At verse 1, what did Paul say? He told the church at Corinth, he said, Be you followers of me. Now, unfortunately, some of our good fine brethren today, that's where they stop at 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Because they're too hung up in their favorite preacher. But what they don't realize is they need to read the rest of it. Paul says, Be you followers of me, even as I am also of Christ. Paul says, I'm trying to imitate Christ. I'm trying to be more like Christ every single day. So don't mimic what I do because I have flaws. I'm not perfect. And that goes for Corey Smith too. 
Trust me, I mess up daily. You follow me around very long, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. But I'm striving to get better. And Paul says, be like me in how I imitate Christ. Look also at, at chapter 14. Paul elaborates on this. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 12. <clears throat> Paul says, even so you, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. Of course, that's a lot of big words. I don't really understand what Paul is saying here. Let me put it in the simple layman's terms for you so you can understand. What Paul is basically saying is, don't be satisfied with just showing up on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, sitting in a seat, and, okay, we're going to go through this for an hour, and then I got a lot of stuff I need to do whenever we get out of here. Oh, I wish he'd be quiet. He sure is talking a long time this morning. Does he not know I have places I need to be? But I've done my, I've done my duty for Jesus. That's the majority of the religious world today. They won't feel like they've done their duty through one hour on Sunday morning. But Paul is saying, seek that you may excel. Don't be satisfied with mediocrity. Don't be satisfied with good enough. Always be seeking to go to that next level. Why? He tells us right there. Seek that you may excel to the edifying, to the encouragement, to the building up, to the growth of the church. If you and I and every other person who claims to be a faithful member of the body of Christ would always be trying to get to that next rung on the ladder spiritually, we could bring more people with us. And the church could grow. Don't get caught up in the numerical growth of, man, look at all the empty seats in this auditorium. I sure do wish we could fill it up. I remember back in the 50s, this thing would be busting out the seams. Quit worrying about the numbers on the attendance board. Be more focused on the people being there for the re the right reason. Not to be seen, not to say, I go to the Petersburg Church of Christ, and I sit on the fourth row, fifth one from the end over there. And if you think I haven't heard that in my lifetime, you're fooling yourself. There are people that would start an all-out war if you came in here and sat in their seat. If you got their parking spot in the, in the out in the parking lot, foolishness. That's not edifying the body. Edifying the body should be out here every single day, trying to find someone that we can share the gospel with. Put one of these Alan Webster tracks in their hand. Put a Michael Shank muscle to shovel book in their hand. Something instead of, well, I've done my duty on Sunday morning. Paul says. Wake up and do not follow afar. What else was a problem that the Apostle Peter had? <clears throat> Luke 22, <clears throat> we saw where he was following from afar in verse 54. And that's not, a, that's not a fire, it's from afar. A long way back. Luke 22, verse 54. He followed afar off and in verse 55... And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were sitting down together, Peter sat down among them. Peter got in with the wrong crowd. Not only had he denied Christ, but now he didn't want to get too close to him. Now he's getting off with the wrong bunch. And notice what happened there in verse 56. But a certain maid beheld him and sat by the fire and earth and looked upon him and said, this man was with him also. And he denied saying, woman, I know him not. I don't know anything about him. Peter's really starting to fall now because he's getting mixed in with the wrong crowd. Well, no man can follow Christ from afar off. And evil associations, we see in verse 1 Corinthians, what does it tell us? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, Paul tells the church at Corinth, be not deceived, evil communications, evil companions corrupt good manners or good morals. You hang around with the wrong crowd long enough and they're going to start to influence you. I heard it said many times before, you hang around with the dogs, don't be surprised when you come up with fleas. When you run around with people who are not going to help you grow, 
in your spirituality, don't be surprised when you start falling off. And let me put it this way too. Don't be surprised when you keep hanging around people who claim to be Christians, but they're off in some denomination that teaches something contrary to the Bible, that you start second guessing yourself. Next thing you know, you're going to be saying, well, it doesn't say we can't have mechanical or musical instruments in the worship. It doesn't say we can't do that. What would be wrong with it? Well, you know, I, I'm all for women's rights. We all, we, all, we all just let the woman get up there and preach. Oh, well, you know, if we, if we take the Lord's Supper too often, we lose the meaning of it. So let's only do it once a month or once a quarter on Easter and Sunday, Easter and Christmas. You hang around with the wrong people. Don't be surprised when you start fitting in with them. And don't be surprised when you're like Peter and you deny Jesus like he did here in Luke 22 so that you can fit into the crowd. A true Christian is going to be an outcast. Contrary to what the world will tell you today. Well, it's, it's not somebody that the whole world is going to love. As a matter of fact, Jesus even said the whole world is going to hate you. So Matthew 26, look at this idea of Peter. Matthew 26 in his fall, he's still falling. Matthew 26 down about verse 69. Look what else happened to it. There we go. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came to him saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. And he denied before them all, saying, I know not what you're saying. And when he was gone out in the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for your speech betrayeth thee. Then he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not man. And immediately the cock crew. Peter had fallen. He had hit rock bottom. Not only had he stood up and said, I'll go anywhere with you, Jesus. I'll die with you. But when the opportunity to die with him came, what did he do? He cursed and swore with an oath. I don't know, man. Never heard of it. Is that you? Has the opportunity to stand up for Jesus and his truth ever presented you? And you said, ah, yeah, and you him haul around about it. When you could take a stand. Is that you? Is that me? Look at. There at uh, verse 41. In that same chapter. What had happened? Watch and pray. That you enter not into temptation. The spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. Peter had gone from on fire for Jesus. The spirit being willing to what? Flesh was weak. He fell. But look what Peter said. Second Peter. In his epistle that he wrote. Second Peter chapter 1 at verse 10. As we see where he has hit rock bottom. And he comes back and he writes to the church and he says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things... You shall never fall. Always be working to grow stronger, to grow closer to Jesus. Why? Because it makes it harder for you to fall. Oh, Peter, he, he thought he had some faith until the heat got turned up on him. Now, we've seen where Peter has fallen, but let's look at where he starts back on that upward climb to being faithful again. What did it start with? Well, it was real simple. Luke 22, Luke 22, verse 61. We see where Peter has gone so far as to cursing and swearing that he doesn't know. And there in verse 60, Peter answered and said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know this Jesus. And while he spake the cock group. Look what happened in verse 61. The Lord turned and he looked upon Peter. 
And Peter remembered the word of the Lord. And he said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. I'm going to tell you something. If you were in the position of Peter right there, and you didn't do exactly what Peter did in verse 62, you got a cold, cold heart. You got problems. That would absolutely tear me apart to know what I had said just hours before, promising the Son of God that I will never leave your side, I will die with you. And within just a matter of hours, I've got the opportunity to put the rubber to the road and back up my talk with a walk, and I didn't do it. And the very person who I had told them that I would be there with them through thick and thin heard me deny them, and they turn around and look at me like, that, that would tear my heart out. And we see that happen with Peter. This is the beginning of him hitting rock bottom to coming back up. Look at the idea, and keep this in mind. Look at Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4 and verse 13. The idea that Jesus is always watching us should keep us in line. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, Hebrews 4.13. But all things are naked and opened under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Jesus is always watching everything that we do. Proverbs, back in the Old Testament, talks about that as well. Proverbs 15 in verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Before you say those words, before you take that action, always remember, even when you are somewhere by yourself and you think nobody else is going to see or hear what you say and do, Lord knows. And when you say and do those things contrary to what he expects of you, you might as well be like Peter there in the palace. Cursing and swearing, I don't know it. But Jesus is watching you, and he's disappointed when you go contrary to his will. Matthew 26. Peter's on the way back up. Matthew 26, verse 75. Peter remembered the words of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. A remembrance of Christ's words will always lift us up. Forgetfulness, forgetting the words of Christ, that will put us down. Jesus said to the lukewarm church at Laodicea in Revelation 2, verse 5, What's he going to do to the lukewarm? To those who say they're on the side of Jesus, but their actions say otherwise. Revelation 2, 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and what? Repent. Turn back and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thee from thy candlestick from your place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Every fallen person needs to remember. And remember how he once lived a better life. And remember the words of Jesus. Even when you realize, look, I've messed up. The words of Jesus tell us we can come back. But we've got to stop doing those things that have caused us to fall. And repent. Repent means you, you're going that way. But now guess what? Going back this way. Going back towards Jesus. Now, here's where most of the world misses it. Luke 22, at verse 62. Peter is on his way back up. He's on his way turning back to Jesus. And in verse 62, what did Peter do? He went out and he wept bitterly. Godly sorrow. He remembered the words of Jesus. And he realizes how he has disappointed Jesus, how he has failed him. Most of the world today, when they're caught in sin, eh, okay, whatever, not a big deal. 
it should absolutely break your heart to know that you are failing Jesus, that you are falling away. The things of the world do not produce godly sorrow. Peter wept because he realized what he had done to Jesus. Peter realized that Jesus was being taken captive, that he was going to be crucified because of what he had done to him. When he had said, I'll die with you, Jesus, he realized, you know what? I should be right there with him. He should be right there being scourged and whipped and spit upon and cursed at and humiliated. But he wasn't. Why? Because he had denied him. He had fallen away. Now, Peter also repented. Look at 2 Corinthians and what we can do today. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 at verse 10. What does Paul say about repenting? For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. What's he talking about? There's being caught and sorry because you're caught. That's not godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is you're called out and you realize why you've been called out. And you realize that you need to make a change, and therefore you go about making that change. And you pledge, I'm not going to continue to do these whatever it is that I know now is wrong. I cannot continue in that. Give you an example of Paul. Best example you can have. Paul was persecuting Christians, killing them. But when he was converted, when Jesus confronted him, when he learned the gospel and obeyed it and was baptized, washing away his sins, he didn't continue going out and killing and persecuting Christians. No, what did he do? He did just the opposite. He went about spreading the gospel and adding more souls to the kingdom. Paul says, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather work with his hands that he may have something to give away. Do you understand the idea of repentance now? It is not just, well, they got me. <laughs> Didn't think anybody would ever catch me, but they got me. Oh, I'm sorry about that. No, it's doing just the opposite of what you've been doing wrong. You make it right. Peter was faithful. He was not sinless, but Paul later rebuked him because he was to be blamed. Look at Galatians chapter 2. Galatians 2, verse 11. Paul writing to the church in Galatia, the churches in Galatia, rather. When Peter was come to Antioch, I was stood into the face because he was to be blamed. Why? For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, when the Jewish people came, what did Peter do? He withdrew himself and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Peter was a hypocrite. Why? Because at Antioch, here you had Gentile people. Remember who took the gospel to the Gentiles, by the way? Oh, that was Peter. But when James and the other apostles came down from Jerusalem, instead of Peter sitting over here and fellowshipping with the Gentiles, he's like, oh, I don't want to be seen with them. Yep. I'm over here. He was playing the hypocrite. And Paul called him out on it. He said, look here. If you're going to preach that the Gentiles and the Jews are all of one nation now, you need to practice it, Peter. He didn't, want, he didn't want to be cut out of the fellowship of those of the circumcision, the Jewish people. But he was faithful and he was to be blamed. But he continued in the Christian race and was faithful unto death, Revelation 2, verse 10. Then finally... Look at John chapter 21. John chapter 21, beginning at verse 18. See what Peter had to say to Peter, to, or Jesus had to say to Peter. At verse 17, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he said unto him a third time. He said this to him three times. Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, 
Thou knowest all things. And keep in mind, this is after Jesus has died. He says, Knowest thou love thee? Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. And when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This he spake, signifying what death Peter should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, Follow me. But then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter was faithful unto death, and you and I can be as well. And according to secular history, it came to pass that way, that he was no longer afraid. He fiercely and heroically preached Christ, and he died for his faith. Perhaps you have fallen away as well. Perhaps you've been faithful, but when the opportunity to stand up for Jesus presented itself, you shunned the responsibility. You shunned the opportunity to do so. You could always come back, though. If anybody failed Jesus, it was Peter. And don't sit there and say, oh, I've done such terrible things. Jesus would never take me back. You're lying to yourself because Jesus will take every single one of us back if we'll but repent. So the question may be asked, what must I do to be saved? If you're here today and you've never obeyed the gospel, I ask you this question. It's a very simple question. It's a yes or no question. You must hear the gospel. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Have you heard that Jesus Christ is the son of God? Have you heard that he lived a sinless life here on this earth, was crucified on the cross of Calvary for you, shed his precious blood that your sins could be washed away and was resurrected on the third day and is now reigning at the right hand of God? Have you heard that? Great. Next question. Do you believe that? You've heard it, but do you believe it? He who believes and is baptized, Jesus said, will be saved, Mark 16, 16. But he who does not believe will be condemned. The question is asked, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe that he died for your sins and do you believe that he was risen on the third day? It's a yes or no question. There's no yes or no. Do you or don't you? Because if you do believe that, then you should be ready to turn away from your worldly lifestyle. No matter what your friends say are popular, no matter what your family says, well, you were always raised in this church right here. Don't you go over there, then, people. Or whatever your case may be. Stop living for yourself. Crucify the old man of sin. Put him to death and rise to walk and live for Jesus Christ. Because in Acts 17, verse 30, Paul tells those in Athens, he says, truly these times of ignorance, not knowing what the true God was, Jehovah God has winked at. He's turned a blind eye to it. And now he commands all men everywhere, no exceptions, to repent. You ready to do that? Because if you are, I ask you this question. Are you ready to confess that belief? Or are you going to be like Peter and say, oh, I don't know nothing about that, Jesus. I don't know nothing about it. Never heard of it. Because in Romans 10, 10, Paul tells us that the, with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. What confession? Acts chapter 8, like the eunuch did. In verse 36, when they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Well, how did he know about that? Peter or Philip had preached it to him as part of the gospel. Mark 16, 16. And in Acts 8, verse 37, Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, then you may be baptized. And the eunuch answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he went down in the water, both of them, and Philip baptized him. You ready for that? Are you ready to be baptized? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Are you ready to confess that before men? Are you ready to turn away from living for yourself and living for Jesus? Then you're ready. Because in Acts 2, verse 38 when those on Pentecost said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? We realize that we are responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. Peter said, Repent and be baptized every single one of you in the name or by the authority of Jesus Christ 
for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And at that point, now you're where Peter was. It doesn't end coming up out of that baptism. That's where it starts. You can either fall off like Peter did, and hey, it can happen. It happened to the best of them. It happened to Jesus' so-called right-hand apostle. So don't think it can't happen to you. But you can come back. Because if you don't, Jesus says in Revelation 2.10, if you're not faithful unto death, I won't give you the crown of life. The only ones who will inherit the crown of life are those who are faithful unto death. We ask the question today, are you ready to obey the gospel? Do you need to come back from your first from come back to your first love after falling off? Or do you just need help? Do you need prayers? Do you need encouragement? Whatever the case may be, we're here to help you. We're here for you. Let it be known, as we say. And Oh, and I 
for this first day of the week when we can gather together with fellow members of the body of Christ to remember the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for this unleavened bread, which on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. As we partake of this this morning, Father, may we think back to those scenes of Calvary, the love that Jesus had for us, that he was willing to die for us that he was willing to go through that excruciating and humiliating death, the nails in his hands and his feet, the crown of thorns upon his head, the whipping, the lashing. He went through that all, Father, because he loved us and he was willing to die for us. May we take of this in a worthy manner and be well-pleasing in your sight. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Likewise, Father, we thank you for this cup, which Jesus took and he gave to the disciples and said, Take, drink, this is my blood, which is of the New Testament, which is shed for you. May we think back to those scenes of Calvary, Father, and remember that without the shedding of his blood, there could be no forgiveness of sins. And it's that same blood, Father, that can continually cleanse us when we fall short of your glory and allow us to stand holy and righteous before you. May we examine ourselves, Father, as we partake of this this morning, and do so in a manner that's pleasing unto thee in accordance to your will. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. this time, let us give thanks for all the many blessings that we have received and give back a portion unto the, to the Lord as he has blessed us with. Following this first day of the week, we come before you thanking you for every blessing that we receive, for the spiritual blessings that can be found only in the body of Christ, and for the physical blessings that you bestow upon us every single day. So many, Father, that we take for granted and we shouldn't, the air that we breathe, the food that we eat the roof over our head, the clothes on our back. And so many, Father, we, we thank you every single day for blessing us, for the talents that you've given us to be able to go out and to be productive members of society, provide for our families, but most importantly, Father, we get back to you this first day of the week as you have blessed us with, that the work of this congregation can go forward, that the gospel will be sped, spread throughout this community and even throughout the world, that people all around to come into contact with the gospel of Jesus Christ and to know about him and be able to obey that plan of salvation. May we use these funds in such a way that bring glory and honor to your name that could help broaden the kingdom of Jesus Christ. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
As always, we thank you for being here with us this morning. Certainly glad you're all here with us. For those that are listening online, we appreciate your attention as well. If something has been said this morning that you don't agree with, let's talk about it. Let's sit down with your Bible, open it up, and let's study. Let's see what the Word of God says. Not what you think, not what you feel, not what your family, your favorite pastor or preacher has told you. One-on-one, -on -one, let's sit down and talk about it. For those of us that are listening, though, that are faithful members of the body of Christ, let's be reminded of what our mission is. Not to go out and see how many people we can put a food box in their hand. That is not the gospel mission. The gospel mission is to go out in Mark 16, 15, 16 and preach the gospel to every creature. That is direct from Jesus. Why? Because he said, whoever believes the gospel and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not will be condemned. There's going to be a lot of condemned folks on the day of judgment because you and I and any other faithful member of the body of Christ didn't go out and preach the gospel. We were too busy being popular and well-liked in our community. That's not going to save a single soul. The gospel is what will save people. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power unto salvation. Keep that in mind as we go about this week. We're going to be seeing people we probably wouldn't see any other time of the year, hopefully. Let's take every opportunity that Jesus Christ gives us. Let's sing this as our closing song. Let's pull Paul just this. <clears throat>
not a picture. Many more, Father, that we cannot call the name at this time. Pray for your continued guidance and protection. And pray that you will forgive us of any unforgiven sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.